Thought I turned it on. I believe I'm dead. You did? Yeah. I don't. I don't look dead. Thanks. You know. Yeah, but going to Florida. I get. I get. A, I get a full two compliments a year. And, uh, I, I look forward to the next one. Six months. Six months away. All right. Now we're on. How's everybody doing? Good. Good to see all your shining faces. I. I was in Florida, as, as uh, Brad said, and I brought back this beautiful color and uh <laughs> and uh some sand in my shoes so uh we'll uh we'll we'll, we'll uh keep those two things uh, at, at the forefront um as we go go along um glad to see all of your uh your happy shining faces out here this morning again um thanks for uh, for, for joining in along with us uh kiddos how are we doing great great are we really doing great did any of you guys complain as you guys got up and had to get ready for church today? Nobody? Everybody was excited? That's good. Today we're going to learn about a time when the Israelites were complaining. And as we, uh, as we hear about this, we're going to keep track of the number of times you hear the word grumble today, okay? And so if you hear the word grumble, you might make a, a note and, uh, and keep track of that while we, while we worship today. Um, last week we were we were looking at uh, Exodus 15. If you remember last week, I know a lot has happened uh, in the Snyder household. I don't know if, if everybody else filled their week quite the way we did. About about 90 percent of our week was either traveling to, um, traveling around, or traveling back from Florida. So um, uh, Exodus 15 was where we were last week. We looked at a song that uh, that was sung by led by Moses and uh, sung by all of the Israelites. Um, a, a song that was uh, declaring the, the greatness, the goodness of God for uh, his people. And, and so uh, all of the, Israel joined in together in this, uh, this amazing song about how he had saved them, how he had liberated them out of slavery in Egypt. And uh, I, I imagine that that moment for the Israelites was um, one of those, those moments of singing together when you have like all of the hairs on the back of your neck that stand up. You ever had one of those situations where you're at a, a conference or a camp or a concert or um, a worship service, right? And and uh, you're singing with the Lord's people, and all of a sudden, you know, you get that that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling as everybody hits that that melody together, and and uh, you just have this this overwhelming experience of of worship in one of those moments. And I I imagine that it was a lot like that for the people of Israel in that moment. They had this. This, this ecstatic utterance that they're singing to God about how he has saved them from the, the clutches of defeat, the, the, the sure defeat that they were going to have against the Egyptians. He opens up the sea. They walk directly through it on dry land. And as they make their way to the other side, the sea comes crashing down and, and all the Egyptian enemies are gone. And so they sing to God in, in praise. And uh, what we're going to see this week as we turn one chapter, like from 15, where they're singing for joy at, at the goodness of God, in chapter um, 16, we're going to see a totally different spirit. Um, we're going to see a totally different Israelite people before their God. Um, they're they're going to have this, this sudden transition from worshiping to whining, right? From, from, uh, from being uh, elated by what God has done for them to complaining and grumbling at God for the situation that they are they're in. And it becomes this this concert of complaint. Um, and if uh, if if they were uh, singing the words on a Sunday morning, you might look at this and think of it as a uh, as now they're, it's Monday and they're back in the office or they're back at school or they're back, you know, in in the their families. They're back in the same situation that they 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 thought they escaped for a moment as they came together on Sunday. And now they're back in in the world and they're back with everything that they have going on. And they start to, to voice their complaints. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever get, get back into the work week and you're like, like sometimes it doesn't take me out of, out of Sunday to get to that point, right? I'm like, it's still Sunday and I'm already starting to complain about the week that's ahead. And, and I think that's where the Israelite people are as we open up chapter 16. We have saw throughout this, this book of Exodus that, that uh, this is essentially a salvation story. Um, it's, it's talking about the salvation of 
the Israelite people, how God saved them out of this slavery and bondage that they were in in Egypt. And, and this book is a prelude to our own salvation story. It's a prelude to the way that God brings us out of slavery to, to sin and death and the devil. And he brings us into the goodness of, of his kingdom and, and in, into to liberation, right? But there's a question that we have to answer. Um, and that question is, how do we live as, as free people? Like once we've been saved from the, the clutches of, of sure death and, and everything that comes along with, with being sinners in a fallen world and, and, and having sure death ahead of us and a second death, once we've been saved from that, now that we are free people, how do we live in the freedom? What is that supposed to look like? And that's really where we find the Israelite people as they start to go about living as free people with the God who's saved them from the, the tyranny of, of Egypt. Um, but here's the problem. Even though he saved them from the tyranny of Egypt, he hasn't, he hasn't yet saved them from the tyranny of themselves. And, and, and we find that all throughout our walks, right? Like we've been saved from the tyranny of sin, death, and the devil, but we haven't been saved from the tyranny of ourselves. And many times we fall back into the same old patterns that we've lived on, under for so long. What we find in, in this, this portion of the, the Israelite journey out of Egypt is that, that though God has taken them out of Egypt, it's going to be a long, arduous process of taking Egypt out of the Israelites. It's going to be really hard to get, get all of the past behaviors, all of the, the things that they've grown accustomed to, all of those things away from the Israelite mind. And, and that's exactly what God is going to do as he takes them on this journey. And it's a journey that mirrors our own pattern of, of life as Christians. That it is, is, is precisely why we can glean so much from the book of Exodus as we as we go through. And so if you have a Bible with you, you want to open it up, a uh, tablet, you want to open up to a, a Bible app, um, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 15, uh, 16 this morning, um, starting right there at the beginning. And we're going to see where God leads them as they travel with him away from the slavery of Egypt. Uh, Exodus 16, starting in verse 1, it says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam, and they came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. And so what we see right away is, is where God is leading them. God is leading them to a specific place, um, the wilderness, right? He's taking them out into, it says, the desert of sin, right? This, this desert situation, uh, a desolate place where there isn't a lot, right? When we see wilderness in the Bible, it's not talking about wilderness like forest. It's talking about wilderness like desert. And so he's, he's taking them out into this, this desert of sin, a place that's devoid of food. There's not a lot of water to be found. It, it is a place that, that all of the elements are, are uh, brutal and, and that, that the elements would, would lead away from thinking about a flourishing life. And so that's where God is taking them, into this, this wilderness situation, into the desert uh, there. And, and, and this is not a direct route to, to Canaan, where they're going, right? He's told them he's going to take them to the promised land. We know where the promised land is. They don't know that, um, but they didn't have to go through the desert. God chooses to take them through the desert. Um, this is, uh, if they were going straight to Canaan, they would have went directly east, but they don't. They go south here, and they're going into the desert because God is going to use the desert as a proving ground for his people. This is going to be a place where they are for a, an extended amount of time where they're going to learn something about who they are and how they can trust God and how they need to, to rely on him. And we're going to see three things, I think, as we look through chapter 16 this morning. We're going to see a grumbling people, a grumbling people. We're going to see a gracious provision, gracious provision by God to those grumbling people. And then finally, we're going to see the third thing, a greater point. Um, the, the point of all of it that is going on here in chapter 16. And so let's begin with, uh, with, with the, the grumbling people that we find in chapter 16. Look at verse 2. Um, they're coming out of Egypt. It says, In the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat. We ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death, right? So, so they're they're looking at the situation and they're thinking like this is this is the worst, Moses. Like we we had it good in in, in Egypt, and you brought us out here to die, right? Um, they're they're all hungry. They're all um, 
into this, this period where that hunger has turned into hanger, right? And they're, they're corporately grumbling. This isn't just a few bad apples here and there. This is, this is the, a concert of, of complaint by the entire uh, company of Israelite people. They are in, unhappy, and the entire assembly has now turned on Moses and Aaron. They're, they're grumbling against uh, Aaron and Moses, and, and they are like immature children starting to whine about their situation. Um, and, and just a couple of observations I think we make really quickly here about where they are as grumbling people. The first one is that they're exaggerating their past situation, right? They look at the past through these rose-colored glasses where, where they're looking back at Egypt with fondness in their hearts. They're thinking, oh man, we had it so good in Egypt, right? Forgetting all of the, the brutal uh, things that were going on there. Forgetting the fact that, that, that the, the Pharaoh was, was, was trying to kill the, the young men of, of Israel. Forgetting all of that, they just look at the, the, the point of, of having food at the ready there in Egypt. And that's all they want to remember about that. They're, they're thinking about the glory of their past life. And they, they say, remember how great it was in Egypt. We had all the food we wanted. It was just Thanksgiving, day after day, right? It's like all the food we could eat every day, all day. We had everything that we ever wanted. Pots of meat. It was so good there in, in Egypt. And they're exaggerating the, the past, right? Like, like children do. Like when, when children look back at, at things and they, they, they exaggerate the, the situation that they're, they're coming from. And, and then the second thing that we see there, this immaturity that wells up in the Israelite people, is that they're, they're misrepresenting their current situation. The current situation is, is way worse than, than what it actually is, right? So uh, my family, we had like a little uh, you know, peek into this um, this past week. We were in Florida uh, and we were um, on the beach. We were in Daytona Beach, right? Like beautiful ocean um, not only were we at the ocean we were like in the middle of the ocean so we go out on this little pier and we're sitting in a, a, a restaurant um, there to get crab right and, and we're gonna have crab dinner surrounded by the ocean in Florida sun blazing it's paradise okay but but one of my children who is going to remain nameless so that you don't help him with rotten vegetables and things um, he, he has this sour look on his face because he doesn't get the fifty pound or the fifty dollar one pound bucket of crab legs, right? And and he is so so sad about this situation that, that he's giving us death stares, right? Um, I, I think this is kind of where the Israel <laughs> the death stare I'm getting right now. Uh, this is where the Israelite people are, right? They they're looking at their current situation. And they're exaggerating. They're, they're misrepresenting what's going on there. And even though God has saved them out of this situation, right? They're, they're looking back with fondness on their past situation that was not good. And they're, they're, they're misrepresenting where they're at right now. We're going to starve to death. By the way, um, they're not even out of their food supplies. Um, here in, in a, a chapter from now, in, in chapter 17, we're going to see they still have all their livestock. Like they, they haven't even exhausted all of their resources and they're saying, oh, you brought us out here to starve to death. It's so horrible, we're gonna die. And it's just this, this awful grumbling, right? Have, have any of the kids here ever grumble before? A couple of you, Tim, good. <laughs> grumble is a funny word, isn't it? Like it's, it's an onomatopoeia, you know what that is? It's a, it's a word that sounds like its definition. And so if you think about it, like when you grumble, you grumble, grumble, grumble. It's, you know, the word actually sounds like what you're doing, right? And so that's, it's one of those, one of those fun words to say. And so you, you kids can, can hold on to that one. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things, right? Like, like grumbling, they're, they're complaining. They, they don't like the situation they're in. They're looking with fondness on their past situation. They're misrepresenting where they are right now. And that's where they are. Just this, this immature bunch of, of people who, who need to be matured. And that's what God is going to do through this desert situation. He's going to bring maturity into their hearts through through this process. And, and so all of the Israelites, they're, they're looking at Moses and they're saying, we're literally starving to death out here. And yet they have all of their livestock still. They're not starving to death. They're, they're just fine. They're just misrepresenting everything. And, and, and as we keep reading, we're going we're gonna to see that this is, is a, a constant state of the Israelite people. Um, they are, they are, are constantly stuck in a single moment at every point in time where, where they don't remember anything outside of this moment for, for right now. It's just a, a sign of immaturity. And so they look back with, with the rose-colored glasses. They look around with dis, uh, delusional miscontentment, you know, discontentment. Like they don't like what's going on. 
Um, they're blaming Moses and, and Aaron, saying it's your fault. You brought us out here to die. And they're being driven by the flesh and by their own desires for the things that they want or the things that they remember having, despite it being different than how they had it. And, and that's the situation they're in as God takes Israel out of Egypt. And now he's going to try to take the, the Egypt out of Israel. Um, they're grumbling and they're, they're self-centered and they're narcissistic over and over and over. Immature, enslaved to their own self-interest. They're talking about my needs and my appetites, my wants, my desires. Sounds a lot like, like us, right? Like if we're, if we're honest, that, that's where we live our lives. Our, our circumstances aren't always um, the, the root cause of our grumbling. But, but many times, uh, whatever circumstances are, we grumble about them regardless. Uh, grumbling, actually, it, it's really a heart condition. <laughs> it's, it's something that comes from inside of us. A, a, a grumbling mouth is, is the product of a grumbling heart. Um, the, we, we speak the things that, that are inside of us. Jesus talked about this, right? He said, it's not the things that come into a man that corrupt him, it's the things that come out of him, right? And so grumbling, it comes from, from some sort of false belief that's inside of us that we believe we, we deserve better. Like, I, I think God owes me better than whatever's going on right around me. I want this, and therefore I need this. I'm tired of waiting. I want it right now. It's mine, and, and I want it now. And, and that's kind of where Israel is at in this, this situation. These beliefs, they start to bubble up, right? And, and they start to come to the surface, and we hear grumble, 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 grumble throughout the crowd of, of Israelites. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we live in a, a society full of grumblers. We live in a, a complaint culture. <laughs> like, all around us are complaints all the time. All you have to do is look through social media. I guarantee you, you'll find somebody complaining about something at any point in time, right? Like, like we live in a, a place where it's, it's just the air we breathe and the water we swim in. We don't even notice it. It's just there. And, and we kind of fall into it. Uh, a few years ago, a comedian named uh, Louis C.K. was on a late night show, and he was talking about this. And, and, uh, and he had this amazing, uh, amazing line that was, everything is amazing right now, and no one is happy. Um, that, was, that was kind of his tagline for this whole bit that he did. Uh, everything is amazing, but nobody's happy. And then he, he talked about how um, things that, that we just take for granted, like things that we would universally recognize if they're pointed out, things like um, the fact that when we were growing up, we had to use rotary phones. Remember those? Like, <laughs> <laughs> right and, and and you were attached to a cable right like how many of you guys remember like hearing the phone ring and and racing your siblings to the phone because you didn't want them to pick it up in case it was somebody who liked you right like there there was these situations like some of you guys you'll never notice these things you these are these are foreign ideas to you because today we have a, a phone in our hands that takes better pictures than any camera we had back then that does all of our banking for us, that, that can also make phone calls and send messages and, and work like you know, mail would back when we were kids, right? Like we take these things for granted. And, and so Louis C.K., he's pointing this out. He says that, that there was a, a, a situation that, that he was in recently where he was on an airplane. And as he was on this airplane, the, the, the announcement came over the, the intercom, hey, we have Wi-Fi. So everybody who wants to connect to our Wi-Fi, you know, this is the this is the situation. He said he pulled out his laptop and starts, oh man, this is awesome. I can I can do an email and I'm I'm looking at YouTube videos and, and you know I'm I'm surfing the web on this plane. He said, and then a few minutes later, like 10 minutes later, um, it all went out. He said, he said, and it was it was it was so funny to watch the guy next to him incensed that that now the the the, the internet was out. Something that he didn't even know existed 10 minutes before when they made the announcement. Like now he feels like the world owes him the internet Wi-Fi on a plane. And so he, he said it was just a perfect example of how everything is amazing and no one's happy. And, and over and over and over we see this, like a modern day prophet, he just notices this and, and calls it out, right? And, and that really this is, this is the heart of the grumbler, isn't it? That, that everything's amazing, but, but, but no one's happy. Um, that, that, God has given us the provisions that we need, but it's not what we want, and so we grumble about it. Um, we, have, we have the things that, that God has placed in our lives, but we want, we want better, we want more, we feel like we deserve something that, that hasn't been given to us, and, and somehow we feel like God has let us down by not giving us whatever it is that we want or desire. And really, that is the heart of a, of a grumbler. Um, God hears the complaint here, and look at his response, verse 4. 
It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are going to reach out, uh, reach out every day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what, uh, what they bring in, and that is uh, to be twice as much as they gather on the other day. Why? Anybody know? Sabbath, right? Yeah, so they're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, so don't go out and gather things on the seventh day. Gather a double portion on the sixth day, and somehow it's going to last twice as long just that one day. Again, a supernatural thing that God is doing for the Israelite people. Verse 7, he says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 6. He says, uh, so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that this is what the Lord has, uh, who brought you out of Egypt. Um, and, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Uh, who, are, who are we? that you should grumble against us. And, and so what we see here is that, that despite the fact that they're grumbling against Moses and Aaron, God takes this as an affront to himself, right? Because they're they're in the role of, of, of you know, his, his representative to the people. So them grumbling against Moses and Aaron is a grumble against God himself. And so God hears them. It says that four times in this chapter. God hears them and he answers them. God hears them, he's listening, he hears their grumbling, and rather than, than taking it as a rebellion against them, he just takes it, um, taking it as a distrust of him, he, he takes it and, and he turns it around. Um, instead of listening to them and, and thinking, you know, that, that they're saying, God, you're, you're doing it all wrong, you owe me better, I could do it better if I was just in charge, uh, God hears what they say, and, and, and he he's, he's asking this, this question to, I think, each and every one of us through this situation, what is it that you find yourself complaining about? When, when, when things boil up in, in your heart, what is it that you find yourself grumbling about most, on, most often? What, what is that thing for you? I mean, I, I think that if we just took a moment, um, each of us, and, and thought through where our complaints were this past week, um, where our complaints have been over the, the past month or, or course of time, um, over this season of our life, we might find something about ourselves, about how we are discontent with who God is, or how we distrust his provision for us, right? I, I think as Christians, we don't often think that God won't save us in the ultimate sense. I think our problem is that we don't think he's going to provide for us in the here and now so often. And, and so the things that go on in our lives, the situations and the circumstances that, that, that boil up inside of us and the, the hardships or struggles that we face, we start to grumble against God, feeling like he owes us better, that we deserve more. What, what is awesome about God is that instead of responding in the way that I might respond, he actually responds in grace. And so let's look at that. He, he responds with a gracious provision. Um, these, these people, they're, they're grumbling, and God's answer isn't to just strike them all dead, which he would be completely in the right to do. Um, he's, he's taken them out of this situation in, in Egypt. He's, he's, he's saved them when they had no way not to be dead people already, and here they are grumbling against him. But, but he's not like me. <laughs> uh, he is so, so good. Uh, it, it shows us something about, about God. I think it's something about the gospel, right? It shows us that, that God gives out of his goodness, not because of ours, right? God gives out of his faithfulness, not because of our faithfulness. That, that God is, is so, so good. Look at verse 11 for just a moment. It says, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard your grumbling or the, the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them. At twilight, you will eat meat, and in the morning, you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now, the word filled there is the same word that the Israelites were using earlier when they were talking about, we, we used to be filled with, with uh, all the good things of, of Egypt. And so God kind of turns this around. He says, he says, in the same way you longed for those things in Egypt, I'm going to fill you with bread that way. It's a, it's a full, like an overabundance full. Right, so it's it's like a, it's like I'm at the buffet and and like you know you've ate that that last plate that you shouldn't have ate and you had to unbutton like one of your buttons just to be able to sit there and, and, and you know you push back from the table that kind of full like that's what he's talking about here they're full full right and he says uh, uh, verse thirteen that evening quail came and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew on the ground of the camp 
And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the, the ground appeared uh, on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And, and the literal word there is manhu or manna, right? Like, what is it? That's what it means. Um, uh, manna is what is it? <laughs> we don't know. It's, it's there, though, and the God's providing for us. Uh, Moses said to them, It's bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And what I want to focus on here is the bread portion. We're going to forget the quail portion for just today, right? <coughs> quail is something that God's going to provide a couple different times as a temporary thing. But the manna is, is, is the thing that's going to be there all along the journey. For 40 years, God is going to provide manna for the Israelite people. Every single day, they're going to get up and there's going to be manna on the ground. Except for on the Sabbath when they were supposed to get the double portion the day before. But every single day, they have what they need because God provides for them. Because God is giving them the things that they need. And not just a little bit of manna. Not just enough manna. But, but he is filling them with manna. He is giving them an abundance of manna. He says, I will, I will make it rain down bread. Right? Like, like think about how good God is in just, just the way that he provides for us. It's not just that he gives us what we need. He, he gives us far beyond what we need. He gives us an abundance in our lives. That he makes it rain down blessings in our lives too. Um, how many of you would say you like to give good gifts to grumblers? Yeah, my hand wouldn't be up if I wasn't trying to coach you into it. Like, I don't like to give good gifts to grumblers, right? My kids, they get in the car and it's a hot day, super hot. And they're like, oh, I'm so thirsty. I'm going to die. Right? What do I say, Ben? You say, I need something to drink. And I say, swallow your what? Swallow your spit, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's my kind of dealing with grumbling, right? God's so much better than me. I mean, and that doesn't take someone who knows me or knows God. I mean, you know, if you know me and you know God, you know that he's way better than me. But he's, he's so good. He's so gracious to these people. They're, they're complaining and they're, they're bickering and they're just complaining, grumbly people. And, and yet he's so good to them. He, he doesn't just give them what they need. He gives them an abundance. I'm going to fill you with bread. And not just with bread, but with, with sweet tasting bread. Look at this in verse 31. It says, the people of Israel called the bread manna. What is it? Um, and it, was like white, it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Right? Like, like there, there's a picture here, right? God is giving them this, this bread that not only is, is going to sustain them, but it tastes sweet to them. He didn't have to do that. Right? He could have just he could have just given them something that tastes nasty, gross. It's like, you want to complain about it? Swallow your spit, right? But he doesn't do that. He, he gives them something that tastes good. Why? Where are they going? To the promised land, right? A land flowing with milk and honey, right? This is a foretaste of what they're headed toward. This is, this is a, 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 a small picture of what it is that they're coming into um, as God takes these people into this land that is flowing with milk and honey, this, this land that is flowing with blessing and, and delicious uh, flavor and, and, and just the, the precious blessings of everything that God is going to provide for his people. He gives them this foretaste and God provides us for us in the same way. Like every time that we, every time that we eat a meal, right? It's, it's a foretaste of the meal we're going to eat in heaven. Every time that we have ice cream, right? Every time, Riley, we have pizza. I know Riley likes pizza. Um, every time that we have a good conversation with a friend, every time that we have a, a, a belly laugh over a joke that, that tickles us, right? These are all a foretaste of what it's going to be like in paradise with God forever in heaven. Like there, is, there are beautiful things ahead of us. And God, um, he, he says to us in the same way, in the way that he graciously provides for each and every one of us. I want you to have a foretaste of what heaven is going to be like. I want you to taste the good things of this life. I want you to, to be around the people who I've given you um, in, in community. I, I want you to, to see just a, just a small flavor of what this is going to be like. And I think every week we get a little chance at a, a, a sneak peek of God's sweetness to us in the time of, of communion. When we have a little bit of bread, we have a little bit of, of juice, and, and it reminds us that someday we're going to have a, a wedding banquet with, with the lamb, 
right? We're going to have this, this amazing feast in paradise with God. And, and every week we, we gather around and we look forward to this feast with Christ as his bride, this wedding feast, right? Um, this seems like a, a perfect time. I'm going to invite up uh, Brad, and he's going to lead us into this time of communion. Morning, church. <clears throat> Morning. And the uh, pleasure of listening to a message over the weekend was on Friday, and, and the simplicity of the message was uh, was just very powerful. And it's, it comes from Matthew twenty-eight, uh, in chapter uh, or chapter twenty-eight, verses nineteen and twenty, and it's the the Great Commission that we uh, we know of in Scripture, uh, go into all the world, teaching. Make disciples, teaching them to obey all the commands I give them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, the speaker talked about the promise at the end. And uh, it says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And he expounded on the always, right? That we just think about always. And that's just a great big mega theme, right? It's just this always, this forever. It's hard to quantify. But he says that in the literal interpretation of the word always, what the word actually means is the compilation of three Greek words that mean all of the days. And so he expounded on this idea of good days and bad days and regular days. And so as Sean was speaking this morning and, and, and he sent me this passage this week thinking about the grumbling that we do and how the, a heart of discontentment leads to grumbling. And we lose focus on the fact that we have a promise that is eternal. And we have a Savior that died and he was buried and he was raised from the grave to secure that promise. And that that promise is good for all of the days. So, no, <laughs> all the days. So, no matter if you are having a good day, or if you're having the worst day you could ever imagine. Or if you're just experiencing just a regular day. That Jesus is with you in all of the days. And as Sean talked about this morning, you know, we can we can look back at the story of the Exodus and we can think about the things about the fact that <laughs> all of the glory of God is surrounding them on a daily basis. They're 45 days removed from walking across an ocean on dry ground. 45 days. That happened 45 days ago. And they're grumbling. But God says, I'm with you. And how does he say he's with you? He gives them the cloud. He gives them the pillar of fire. It's there eternally. We have that today with the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have faithfully responded to the gospel call in our lives and we've been immersed into Christ, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's with us to secure that promise for all of the days. And Sean talked about the foretaste of what we get to see. So I wanted to look at Revelation 22 real quick. It's just a quick little, uh, and I encourage you to read this further yourself. But uh, in, Revelations, in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, it talks about what life is going to look like for the eternal blessing that we receive. Starting in chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I saw a holy city and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for us. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed. That's the foretaste that we're getting ready to the meal that we get to see is to we get to worship Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. 
the bread of life, the living water. All the promises in Scripture, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are made yes in Jesus. So when we come around his table, when we take his meal, it's a vision of what we're going to be able to do in eternity with him face to face as the glory of God never departs. So as we come around this morning, let's think about those things as we worship the King of Kings and we give him honor and we put him in the right place in our lives and have right perspective of what is to come. Let's pray. Father God, you are a good father. You give good gifts. You care for us. You love us. You're patient with us, uh, even when our hearts grumble, even when inside of past victories we grumble. But you are faithful, and you go far beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine. We lift your name high this morning. We give you glory. And we bow and we surrender our broken lives to you. Because you are the restorer, you are the healer, and you are with us all the days. We pray these things in Jesus' name. So we've uh, <clears throat> we've seen the grumbling people, we've seen a gracious provision. Uh, we're going to finish out this morning with the greater point. What was the greater point of what God was doing? I mean, when you think about the whole manna thing, right? Um, could could God have supernaturally just filled their stomachs? Well, yeah, right. But yet, that's not how He chose to do it. Um, he actually chose to have them take part in what he was doing, right? Like uh, he was providing the food for them. He's providing the nourishment, but he wanted them to go out and to collect it, right? There, there's a, a greater point that is that is here for all of us um, to see. And it, it, he, he wanted to do this in a very particular way. And so he gives them very specific instructions on how they're to go out and be involved and participate in, in collecting this, this manna. Listen to the way he talks about this again in verses 4 and 5. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out and to gather enough for that day. Um, in this way, I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions on the sixth day. They are to prepare what they bring in so that there might be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So on the seventh day, the Sabbath, um, they're going to have this day of rest. So they have to collect this, this extra portion. Um, but every single day, they're going to be involved in what it is that God is doing in providing these things for them. Right. And, and he's going to see, he's going to test, he says, whether or not they can follow the instructions. And, and, and what we see is that, that they have a hard time with this. Uh, jump down to verse uh, 16 it says this is what the Lord commanded everyone was to gather as much as they needed um, to take an omer which is about like a half gallon um, for each person uh, you have in your tent the Israelites did as they were told and some gathered uh, much some little and they measured it out by the omer uh, the one who gathered uh, much did not have too much and the one who gathered little did not have too little everyone gathered just as much as they needed and so you can kind of imagine that you know little Bryce back in the back he's he's not going to collect as much as you know a big strapping lad like like a, you know Wayman is going to get right like fitness model level Wayman you know is going to be able to carry more um, than, than poor little Bryce is going to be able to carry and so you know you have 
have different levels of, of things they're going to bring in. But, but when they all gather it together and they bring it all together, they're going to measure out an omer for each tent. And they're going to have everything that they need as they share the provision of the Lord together. And they distribute it out to, to everyone as they have need. There was plenty. Verse 19, Moses said, no one is to keep any of it until morning. Right? No, no one's supposed to keep it overnight. Eat what you have for that day, and in the morning, God's going to provide again. Right? So don't keep any of it. How do you think they did? Yeah. Not good. Apparently, uh, this was this was too much to ask for some of them. They were they were looking forward to like having a midnight snack, right? So they grabbed a little extra. Uh, however, some of them, it says in verse 20, paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. And so Moses was angry with them. You see, they, they were thinking to themselves, like, what if God doesn't give us manna tomorrow, right? So I'll just, I'll just keep back a little extra. Um, but, but what they find is that you can't follow God on your own terms, right? Like the way that he says that we're supposed to follow him is how we're supposed to follow him. Like he's, he's given us instructions for a very good reason, and that's because he knows better than us what is best for us. Um, even though we imagine that we're different, and we can, we can make it work better for ourselves, he knows better than us what is best for us. And so God gives them this, this amazing explanation that I'm going to provide what you need each and every day. You're going to have everything you need, so just collect what you need. Just keep what you can eat. Don't keep any of it for the next day. Um, because it's just going to end up being nasty, right? It's going to end up with maggots and, and, and smelly things. And, and in the same way, when we think we can follow God on our own terms, it's stinking thinking, right? It's, it's not going to work out for us. It's going to turn out pretty nasty and pretty gross. God is training the Israelite people here. He's teaching them to, to obey and to trust, right? To, to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey, right? We've, we've all sang the song before. This is what he's teaching them there. Like, you, you need to trust me, and you need to obey what I'm, what I'm saying because that shows that you trust me. And so just like a, a mom or a dad might teach their children to, to walk, right? Like when, when Elijah gets a little bit older, we're going to teach him like, you know, hey, it's time to take some steps now. And you, you put your fingers out and he grabs a hold of them and he, and he takes those few steps, right? And then as he starts to take those steps with your fingers, all of a sudden you start to take your fingers away and he takes a couple steps between mom and dad, right? And then you kind of spread out a little bit farther. Well, when, when the baby falls, right, we don't go, well, great, now you're going to be crawling all your life. You know, that's not, that's not how we do, right? So in the same way, God, being a better father than I am, right, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't strike them all dead for not listening. That's not the way that it works, right? So God is going to continue to, to be good to the Israelite people. How do we know that God isn't a person who strikes them all dead? Because for 40 straight years, they have manna. They have this, this thing that shows up every single day. I've heard some say um, that, that manna was like popcorn. Um, I, I don't know where this, this thought comes from, but they say, oh, it looked kind of like popcorn on the ground. If so, it was more like kettle corn, though, because this was, this was the, the sweet stuff of the Lord that he was giving to the people over and over and over, and he wants to build their trust. He wants to, he wants to give them this opportunity for obedience, and, and over and over and over, he's going to train his, his kids how to walk and how to talk and how to live as people of the book, how, how to live as his people on his terms instead of trying to live on their own terms, right? And, and so over and over and over, he's, he's training them to depend on him every step of the way. And I think that is the greater point that we see here, that God wants to train us to trust him each and every day, to, to, to live all the days as if, they are the day that we have to trust the Lord and to follow his instructions. And tomorrow will take care of itself. So let's just worry about today right there in front of us. And let's trust in what God says and follow the instructions that he's given us. Look with me at, uh, at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses is going to make this point to them, this greater point of what God was trying to do through this whole uh, this whole thing. So at the end of the 40 years, um, Moses is now uh, in, in entering into the, the final stage of his life. 
He's getting ready to, to send the people into the promised land that he's never going to get to go to. And, and as he sends them off, he gives them this, this explanation. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you because you were uh, uh, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you or nor your ancestors had known. And why? Why was it that he was doing this? To teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Right? Uh, this, is, this is what Jesus is going to quote later on when, when he's being tempted by the devil. And he says, turn these rocks into bread and you'll have food you need. Right? You've been in these, these, uh, this, the wilderness for 40 straight days fasting and, and you're hungry. Just turn the bread, the stones into bread and you'll have it. Right? He says, no, man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? Every word that comes from God is good and sweet, just like the, the manna for the Israelites. And so God is, is showing us this, this greater point in everything that he is doing through this manna situation, and that is that we would love him, that we would trust him, that we would obey him because we love him when we trust him. God used the, the physical hunger to point to a spiritual need that the Israelites had to, to mature into who he needed them to be. Because wherever God is, that's where life will be found. And so no matter where they went in the wilderness, life was there. And they were in this lifeless place, but life was there because God was there with them. And he was giving them everything they needed day after day after day. You know what the best way that we can combat a, a grumbling heart is? Gratitude. It's, it's, it's a heart of thankfulness. It has to well up from within us. We have, to, we have to have this praise for what God has done for us in bringing us out of slavery and giving us the things that we, we truly need and giving them to us in abundance through Christ. Um, two weeks ago, uh, the elders and I, we were meeting on a Wednesday morning and, and we meet every Wednesday morning at 5.30 a.m. and we pray um, for you guys, right? We, we, we come together and we pray for the, the church. And, and on this particular Wednesday, we were coming together and we were doing a, a spiritual, uh, a communal spiritual exercise because we're in a class about communal spiritual exercises, me and Brad are. And so we were leading the elders through a, a prayer of thankfulness. And really, I say we, but Brad was the one who was leading it. And, and uh, I'll just take credit for you. Um, he, he was he was leading them through this this thankfulness exercise and so we we, we prayed in, in, in thankfulness for our wives and our families and our church you guys and and we went around the the, the circle and we prayed for each other and we, we prayed um, special prayers of thankfulness for each one of the men that were there that morning and and it was just this moment of, of this deep thankfulness and gratitude to God for all that he has done every step along the way for us as a, a body of believers. It, it was this beautiful moment. And, and what I would love for you to have today, as you guys go into home groups, as you guys go into to your time with your, your family groups and, and you sit around a table and you, you talk with one another, is to have a moment like that where you have this opportunity to be thankful for, for the people that God has placed into your lives, who he has knit together in such a way that, that we can glory in the way that God has, has fashioned us. And, and we can praise him for the goodness that he has had for us every single step of the way. And so that's what I want to do this morning as we just finish our time together. If you will, just bow your heads right where you are. And I want you just to lift up some of those, those thankful gratitude prayers to God and, and just in the quiet of, of the room and, and it won't be completely quiet we're going to hear some children as we pray and guess, guess what just pray for them too pray pray God thank you so much for the children that you've given us and, and then I'm going to finish us up with, with a, a, a little prayer after our, our time of, of just thankfulness
Father in heaven, as we just lift up these prayers of, of gratitude and thankfulness to you, um, Father, we are, we are so in awe of how good you really are as a father to us. So much better than any earthly father that we've ever experienced. So much better than, than the best man that we could come up with are, are you to your children. Father, thank you so much for the way that you have provided for us as a body, um, provided for us a meeting place, provided for us souls that, that we didn't know outside of this this arena of life, but Father, that you have, have brought together so that we would be closer than family. Father, we thank you so much for the, the little ones that, that, that we want nothing more than to bring up knowing you and who you are. We thank you for, for the, the, the people that we come in contact with every week as we, as we gather together in community, um, both here and tonight in, in family groups. Father, we, we are so thankful for what you have given us in the body of Christ. And Father, more than anything else, we are thankful for what you have done for each and every one of us in Jesus. We thank you that, that when there was no way for us to have fellowship, relationship with you, that you made a way. That, that in Christ, you came into the world, gave yourself in our place for our sins in order to give us the gift of righteousness, the gift of fellowship with you, so that we might, might walk with you through life. Father, as we live as free people, help us to, to dwell in the liberty that you've given us. Help us to, to look at, at you and, and without complaining or grumbling about the things that we think that we would like, Father, to, to find our hearts full contentment in who you are, how you've made us, and how you provide for us each and every day. Father, uh, help us to have hearts of gratitude hearts of thankfulness for, for what you've provided for us, what you've given us in our lives, and most of all, for Christ. We love you and thank you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me? We're going to have a, a song of, of reflection and response, a song where, where again, we can, we can sing these words of, of gratitude toward the one who has, has brought us out of slavery, the one who has, has, has brought us through the, the, the the freeing waters of baptism and into his glorious presence, into a life where we can walk in fellowship with him, led by his word, the light of the world given to us to, to walk behind. And so if, if you're here this morning and, and you have a, a, a heart of praise, um, lift it up to him in song as we sing this song. If you're here this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus. You have never accepted that he gave his life for you. Um, let this be the day of salvation for you. Let this be the day where you would you would come and, and know that Jesus is king of all. And you would accept him into your heart, follow him into the water of baptism, and be raised to newness of life. All things gone, the new has come. If that's you this morning, I'm going to be right up here in the front singing along with you. Just come over and, and, and talk with me about what the next step is. As we say.
Hey, if you have a seat, I'm gonna turn my microphone back on. If you'll have a, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll turn it off. So. There I am. Hey, I uh, wanted to give you a couple of uh, housekeeping things, a couple of announcements we have uh, coming up. Um, first of all, if, if uh, you would like to be involved in a, a ministry team, you can uh, see the five of them that are uh, up there that just changed, even though I was talking about them. Uh, there they are. I just like, I mean, everybody points out my flaws. Um, uh, yeah. If, if you have any question at all about any of those ministry teams, would you uh, just come in and grab me and I will point you in the correct direction uh, after service. Um, next one. Uh, on <laughs> Monday uh, at GOPO, uh, the ladies are going to have their final uh, meeting of the, the semester. I don't know if you call it semester. Uh, they're going to take a break until fall. Um, so uh, tomorrow at, at 10 will be the last uh, women's Bible study for uh, for this uh, this session. Um, also uh, Wednesday night at six, um, the men have the uh, the disc golf and pray time. So um, come out and uh, and walk the park with us and, and uh, pray and uh, throw some from some discs around. Um, upcoming uh, a class uh, coming up in July on uh, on how to to uh, study the Bible and a class for. Um, just new disciples, kind of what it looks like to uh, to become a uh, disciple of, of Jesus. Um, that's going to start in uh, in July on July 17th. Um, exact dates will be uh, announced a little bit closer to that time. Um, next slide. Uh, on the 22nd, we're going to have our final uh, year-end uh, family group. Um, again, taking a, a break until the, the fall when we'll start back up. Um, we will be at um, the Fulton Event Center, which is across the street from Dairy Queen, um, uh, also across the street from uh, Moser's and not Gerbs. Uh, I was uh, I was told last week. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you would uh, bring a finger food to uh, to share, uh, we will have a time of just getting together and, and fellowshipping with one another and uh, activities, games, good stuff like that. Um, time to uh, to enjoy one another. And so uh, that's that. Uh, slice of life coming up in may the 21st that'll be uh next saturday is that right 21st? yes all right uh mini golf uh we'll meet either at the davis's or lloyd's uh at at 4 or 4 10 you see it there i don't have to really read it to you um but uh <laughs> want to remind uh, all the uh, high school and college age kids uh, we would love for you to be a part of that if you're not already a part of that become a part of that and you will be blessed by it um work day coming up at camp um on the 25th of may that would be uh, a week from Wednesday, uh, we will have uh, a, a time out there where we're going to do a little bit of work. And, and uh, if you've never been to the camp, a chance to just familiarize yourself with it. Um, also want to uh, to remind you that uh, camp registration is opened up. And so if you look on our uh, Facebook uh, page or group, um, I will make sure that uh, registration, hey, there it is, uh, is, is, uh, is linked um, there. Um, and then you can see the the, uh, the weeks for, uh, for kids of... Uh, of the different age groups, um, starting with uh, the fifth and sixth graders, seventh and eighth, third and fourth, and then high school week uh, being the very last week. Um, but if uh, if if you are of age to be at camp, um, we would encourage you to uh, to go to camp. Um, you will be blessed by it, and it will be a uh, an awesome time to uh, to get to know um, some other Christians from the area, Jeff City, um, and uh, and Versailles and Eldon. Um, and, and also just a good time to get to know the Lord, most importantly. Uh, so that's, that's camp. Uh, if you want to, uh, to get announcements from the church through one call, uh, you can text the word ALERT to 22300. We will make sure that you get all of the information um, that we send out for the church, uh, just reminding you of different things going on or uh, upcoming uh, events. And then also, if you are um, wanting to, to have uh, access to Right Now Media, um, get with me and give me your email and then I will send you an invite uh, as quickly as I can and as quickly as I can type in uh, the right email address like I, I had to do uh, for some um, and <laughs> uh, that's all the announcements that I have on there I have two more announcements that were handed to me late uh, one I don't know if you guys know this but um, tomorrow marks one year since the very first time that we kind of met together a year ago in the Saunders house with 47 people. 
um, and uh, we will we will turn one year old as a uh, as a church. And so, what we want to do to celebrate that is that um, tomorrow, between four and six, if you will, um, come and eat next door at Tacos and Tequila. Um, have dinner there, and we want to bless Luis. Luis has been so good to us that he has uh, let us uh, camp out here um, for not quite a year yet that we've been in this location, but. Um, but he has, he has let us be here free of charge. Um, he's he's uh, opened up this space to us and been good to us. We just want to flood him with, with business and pay him back in that way. And then also, uh, it'll give us a chance to get together and celebrate uh, just a year of, of uh, a fellowship as a church. Um, and then finally, um, if you are a high school boy or a college age boy and, uh, and would like to have some information on an upcoming study, um, Brad Roan and uh, Tim Davis are, are going to meet with guys directly after service today. So if you would, just stick around, find one of those two, and, uh, and get the information for that, um, for a, a, a study upcoming. Anything else I need to say on that? That's good. All right, I'm going to say a prayer, and then uh, Lance will sing us out one more time. Father God, we thank you so much for, for this day, for this time, for this opportunity to come and, um, again, remember just how good you've been to us. Um, Father, thank you for um, the folks that are here in attendance. We pray a blessing over each and every one as we go about all the things that we have this week. Give us energy and clarity. Um, Father, fill our hearts with gratitude and, and take us out into the world so that we can sing your praises to everyone we come in contact with, those in our, our workplaces, those in our schools, um, those in our families, and those in our neighborhoods. Lord, let us be the people that, that you have created us to be a people that are called by your name and called to your purpose. Lord, we love you and thank you most of all for Christ, for what he has done for each and every one of us who call him Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand and sing with us? <laughs>
Have a great week. See you guys tomorrow.